Tracing and monitoring. It's a problem that we often talk about on this podcast because it's a thorny one in distributed systems. And we often talk about it from the performance angle. How do you ensure that everything's being processed fast enough? How do you deal with bottlenecks? But this week, we're going to look at it in a much more fine-grained way, at the level of individual events. What if you have, say, a stock trade coming in over rest, getting processed through various systems, and eventually it has to go out over a connector to meet a reporting deadline? Maybe, maybe every trade has to be reported to the regulator within the hour. That's fairly common these days. How do you debug that processing stream at the level of individual events? How do you track a single event through all those steps? Well, joining me this week with one answer is Roman Kolesnev, who's here to talk to us all about open telemetry, what it can do for you, how it works, how you get started with it, and what it does for Kafka and event systems specifically. And he also covers what he found it lacked, the holes that he's been trying to fill, specifically around Kafka streams and Kafka Connect support. He's made a lot of progress and he's got a lot to teach us. And there is more than just event level tracing on offer here, but if you need event level tracing, this is a particularly good podcast to catch. So before we begin, this podcast is brought to you by Confluent Developer. More about that at the end. But for now, I'm your host, Chris Jenkins, and this is Streaming Audio. Let's get into it. On the podcast today, we have Roman Kolesnev, who's joining us from Ireland, I believe. Yep, Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you now you work for, let me get this right, it's CSID, the Customer Solutions and Innovation Division, is that right? Yep. Um, which gets Sysid pronounced... Labs. CSID. Why? So this is the first thing I have to ask you. Why is it not just called CSI Confluent? Um, that feels like it would be cooler. Hmm. CSI. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay. Looking for well, a... <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Um, so you guys get to do all like loads of cool practical things, right? Your department's been yes. doing things like parallel consumer and end-to-end -end encryption and stuff. Yes, we have kind of two strains of work. One, experimentation and like being the crazy scientist slash A-team slash, <laughs> yeah, trying to work out things, how they could be implemented, how they can be done and what's feasible. And part of it is finding the professional service engagements and code that can be generalized and made more reusable. So the things that get implemented multiple times for clients in different engagements that generally could be made a bit more robust and made more reusable and more a bit generic kind of quickly. Right. And Pulling then, out those, pat like, those bespoke patterns into something more useful. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that brings us to what you've been working on lately, because there is a very, very common pattern in building large distributed systems, right? Yes, uh, I'm experimenting with open telemetry and distributed tracing and how it works with Kafka clients and what's available and what's not available, where are the gaps, but we can fix it. Um, it all started more this kind of general, how we can do event level tracing on Kafka and Kafka ecosystem. And then doing different evaluations and exploring what's available already out of the box, different frameworks. And we landed on open telemetry as a new and coming rage for distributed tracing. Okay. Um, Tell me something about open telemetry. So open telemetry is an evolution of open tracing and open census, which originated from Uber. Um, was okay. one of the driving forces. So open tracing was um, doing the tracing side of it. Open census was doing metrics side of it. And open telemetry is kind of new evolution that tries to um, cater for both. Mm -hmm. And its goal is to be vendor agnostic so that you can instrument your applications in different um, platforms and different even programming languages but then have the common semantic convention so that those traces and the information could be 
streamed into common system and they would all conform to similar specifications and you know would understand each other would conform to the same standards okay and so if you've got so, like um your mm-hmm. custom microservices around your organization made with all different kinds of technology you could use open telemetry or if you've yes, got that's like a, a straightforward cast, kafka cluster you could still use it Yes, but even with Kafka cluster, for example, some of your clients may be written in Java and some may be written in Go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So even using the same platform for messaging, because you're instrumenting your clients, you're not instrumenting just the messaging platform, or sometimes you're not instrumenting the platform itself at all, um, you still need to have that conformity on, on your different clients so that the data that they stream, the traces that they stream are similarly looking for the backends and to be able to process them and, and understand. And then a second part, a different part of it is that um, it's vendor agnostic. So you're not streaming traces that only, say, Elasticsearch can consume right. or Datadog or whoever. You, you, yeah. you have your collection system that is slightly uh, separated from your processing system. And you can switch the backend much more easier because um, the exporter layer can be configured to point to different systems and move from one backend to another backend without changing how you collect the data on your application side. Right. Okay. So that's that sounds very nice and reusable. And and you're saying, let me just check. Get I've got check. I've got this right. So you're saying it's both for kind of metric level aggregate statistics. And taking the Uber example, I could trace the events related to a particular trip through the system. Uh, yes. So OpenTelemetry cutters for it has three subsystems: it's tracing, uh, metrics, and logging. Logging is still very experimental. It's still in even more experimental than tracing and metrics. Um, it's not marked as stable on their uh, site, if I'm correct, unless it changed very recently. But the idea is that you need all three generally in your observability. From a trace, you want to jump to logs to look at the logs that correspond to the trace, and then maybe to look at the metrics that were collected, either based on the timing or, again, if you're tagging metrics with trace information, because sometimes it's not enough to just have one side of it. What's the, what's the distinction between tracing and logs? I guess they kind of merged in my head. So the trace records the operations that's been happening and some metadata. And as a developer, you can record business level traces and add uh, metadata around the business logic and around the message. But then the logs are your standard logs that you write from the system that may be message related, but they may be more system related in a sense, like consumer okay. polling logs or um, whatever happening on the system logs. And generally, again, I guess if you're writing a completely new system from scratch, all your message level processing, you could write all the logs as events to the spans, to the traces, and so on. You can probably get away without writing any logs at all um, as, as logs, as such as traditional logs. But if you have already a big system with all the logging implemented and libraries that do the logging and so on, um, then you need to kind of stitch them together, traces and logs, and potentially collecting them in different places as well. Right. So logs are just kind of the general traditional logging line dumping ground of everything we know. And tracing is yes. more kind of business logic above it. Um, it's kind of separate a little bit. I mean, th- there is a very thin line because you can do tracing through logs. You can just dump the logs that contain, oh, I received a message with such and such metadata. I processed it. I sent it somewhere. And you can do it purely through logging. And then say you're using Elastic or Splunk or whatever parsing, and you're just parsing out the logs that are specific to message flow, for example, ignoring everything else. Here's your trace. And you can then visualize it, you can produce metrics out of it, you know, use the log timestamps to work out the performance timings and things like that. And do that all, all purely on logs. But then 
it's more work. Like if you have a library that has it, uh, an SDK, an API that does it in a more easier, kind of more um, understandable fashion when it's talking about, okay, let's record an operation and that operation spans from here to here. And then the next operation that depends on it, that follows from in spans from this point on you know, next point to the next point. And together they make up a trace that captures the flow of this message from through uh, services. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, that, that kind of records it in that natural semantic and both for the developer and then for architect and for operational um, people, you know, looking it up, it's all talking about the operations and spans and traces rather than it's just a dump of logs. Yeah, yeah, okay. I've, I'm with you now. Okay, great. So that kind Sorry, of... just a, a, But then in that context, sometimes logs are still useful because obviously it's hard sometimes to map the information that you want to capture into the semantic of span and trace and even events happening there. You maybe want to add additional kind of data that you can look up then in the logs once you traced the point to which you want to look, here's additional information I want to lift up from the logs now that is related to it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. So if you want to do that kind of application level tracing, is what do you do currently with OpenTelemetry? Is it, is it like, does it have like a Kafka plugin that you just wrap into or what's, what's the deal? It depends. <laughs> it <depends>. favorite answer. <laughs> so if you're talking about Java, let's take the Java because Java clients probably and JVM clients are probably mostly most proliferate, more popular in Kafka ecosystem. Um, so if you're using consumers and producers, the standard Java consumer producer ones, um, you have few ways to use OpenLamp to visit them. You can add a dependency to your project, to your application, and write a bunch of code manually using, you know, add span here, add span there on your application side, just before sending or just after consuming. That kind of is a very kind of base thing. But then you have interceptors you can use. So you can attach interceptor, consumer interceptor, producer interceptor, which would inject the trace points, the spans for send and for receive automatically. Okay. And so can, the other approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you can potentially just drop something in and get automatic producer consumer tracing into open telemetry without changing your code. Yes. Uh, you configure interceptors and they would be loaded for you and do that. Then yeah. another approach is they provide a wrapping producer and consumer. So you can set up open telemetry object in your code and say, give me consumer. Now wrap consumer as a tracing consumer and all its operation will be traced. And the third way is to use Java auto instrumentation. So OpenTelemetry has a Java agent that is written as a using APM, basically like APM library. So it can be loaded alongside your jar through minus Java agent uh, command line parameter, Okay. And it just loads a jar in addition to your app. And then that auto instrumentation has a lot of different implementations. So it would add automatic tracing for, say, Jersey, REST client, or servlet, um, if it's a web service uh, that you're hosting. Same for Kafka, producer, consumer clients, and things like that. Okay. And that's just using the usual kind of Java, the JVM level agent tracing type API. Yes. So the way it works under the hood, it, it has a, it uses ByteBuddy, which is a wrapper for Java ASM library. So ah. at class loading, it injects additional bytecode that then has like advices marked for specific libraries and SDKs and frameworks to wrap them into this tracing behavior. Ah, okay. Right. So yeah. Okay. I'm with you. So which of those, let, let's get a recommendation out of you. Which of those three would you generally recommend people use? Um, I guess the auto instrumentation agent is the, the, the go to 
if you only want to trace Kafka and it's only Kafka, then mm. interceptors are easier to configure and put in, in place. But if you want to add additional uh, things, like you want to add business logic span in the middle, you're doing web service call, for example, things like that, you want the additional instrumentation to be there, then APM, the, the, the agent, is a go-to. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think if I'm going to the effort of installing it anyway, I might as well get things like REST calls thrown in for free, right? Mm. And you can mix and match. So you can have an agent running there that traces the libraries and SDKs use, but then you want to add a span inside your code to 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 create a business logic specific span specific to your process. You can add it in. They don't clash. You can use both at the same time. Okay. So I'm leading into work that you I know you've been doing, but what's it like if um Open Telemetry's agent doesn't support a particular API you're interested in. What's it like to add in some extra support? Um, it supports loading extensions. So in the same fashion as all the instrumentation is written inside the instrumentation agent, you can write your own additional instrumentation uh, as an extension. And then you can instrument the application by using the Java agent you know, command line parameter and all that. And then as additional parameter to it, you can specify, okay, in addition to that main agent, load those extensions, one or more, up to you. And and then you write the same kind of aspect-oriented interceptors, advice classes using ByteBody and so on to add additional behaviors that you need. And that's written in Java? Yes, that's for Java. Okay. So you write some Java code that says, look out for calls to this class function method um, and instrument it this way. Yep, cool. exactly, yes. In your advice, you're saying for this class, you know, namespace class, this kind of method, so for example, public send that takes two parameters and first parameter is integer and second parameter is string, apply this advice. And then you have the capability to do on method enter and on method exit to specify what additional code you want to run. And you can intercept the parameter values that are passed into the method. You can change the return that's being returned from the method with additional, you know, with overridden value if you need to. All yeah. that kind of gives you a lot of uh, flexibility. That, yeah, I've done a, it's been a long time since I've done any aspect oriented programming, but it's very useful for that kind of generic rewriting. And it was, it always reminded me of database triggers. You know, before you insert <laughs> this row, do this stuff, right? No. Yep, but actually, yes, it's quite similar in that aspect. Cool. Same concept in a different domain. So you have been writing these, I know, because the, what have you been doing? What's wrong with the what's um, what's missing in the current state of Open Telemetry's native Kafka support? So for Java again, specifically applications, it covers the consumer and producer tracing quite well. But if you venture a bit outside in the Kafka streams and the Kafka Connect, then the support has gaps in it. So there is a lab, uh, instrumentation for Kafka streams, hmm. but it only targets the handover from the producer, uh, from the consumer into the topology and then tracing the send of the producer. So there is nothing to help with the topology tracing inside. Now, if your Kafka streams topology is not using any stateful operations, if you're doing everything in flight, like some mapping and then send out, that yeah. works fine. The problems start if you're using stateful operations and you write to, want to write some data in the state store, then look it up later for aggregation, for joins, for things like that. Then right. your tracing context is getting lost. Uh, okay, so as soon as you do something like a K table or a join, the support yeah. falls apart. Okay. So you've been fixing that? Yes, I was playing about with that. Uh, and the main problem, there are two things that kind of apply not just to Kafka streams, but in general for frameworks that do that things. Um, one is when the processing has to be kind of one-to-one. -one. 
even on this consumer and producer tracing. For example, um, the way Kafka works, when you poll data, it pulls a batch. So it pulls a batch of messages, yeah? Yeah. And then you have your consumer records object. Normally, you would have a for each loop, for example, that you do something and then you produce out. If you're saying you know, consume produce kind of flow, like in yeah. Kafka streams would be. And that works fine as long as your produce is within that iteration loop. Because the way that interceptors, the tracing uh, code works, is that the consumer records object is augmented to return a tracing itera iterator. So when you iterate, it's not the standard iterator, it's actually a tracing iterator that has hooks that for the next call, it takes a context, uh, tracing context, puts it into thread local, puts it into current, basically, context. And then when you do producer send, it looks, do I have a tracing context in memory? Do I have it active? Right. Use it as a parent and link them together. And now the send is linked to the previous consume and process, basically. Right. Yeah. Now, where it falls apart is if instead of doing for each and within the for each doing the send directly, you, for example, store it into a list, do something, and then iterate that list. Because that list no longer returns the tracing iterator. It has no idea. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. And the context propagation is lost. So where I'm that's, going with this really is... really thorny mm -hmm. because you wouldn't know as a programmer that you've just broken that chain, right? Yes. Like, again, yeah. I guess it tries to cater to, you know, 90%, 95%, whatever, the standard pattern, the one that you can anticipate. Because the problem yeah. that I found as well writing that ex extension, when you're working as a developer on a platform or on the application, you know what you're doing. You know what your processing is. You know what your domain is. You know how you're using it. Yeah. It's slightly less so if you're working on a platform or a library that you give to your internal developers. But even then, you kind of can give some constraints or capture some usage scenarios because you're within the company, within kind of the departments. Mm -hmm. But then when you're writing that instrumentation for general use, like you can anticipate only so, so much. Someone is doing something crazy. Someone is doing something <laughs> completely different that you haven't thought about, you know. Yeah. And sometimes you, you, you can't really just do anything about it. All you can say, okay, this way it works. This way you need to think how to solve it in your code additionally. Yeah. And it's not hard in a sense that you can always, if you need to do that handover, if you're writing to some intermediate buffer or list or whatever before you do processing and send or before you do the send. You can always read the trace context that's available while you're iterating over consumer records. Uh, okay, yeah. Store it somewhere and, you know, store it with the message, store a pair. Here's the message, here's the trace context. Now, when you're passing it to produce, you can say, you know, here's the message, use this trace context for your send as a parent. Yeah. But you have an insight into how Kafka streams tends to work. So you can pick up some of those common patterns. Writing the yes, so the same that. yeah, same thing with the Kafka streams. So Kafka streams, tracing um, propagation and context. So it had kind of two areas that we looked at. One is getting trace to propagate, not to lose it when we're doing stateful operations. And second part of it is actually trace the stateful operations themselves. So whenever we're doing store into RocksDB, into state store, whenever we do a read from it, record spans, for example, record those operations as part of the chain so that you can see it in the trace. And the trace propagation issue, we are fixing exactly in the way as I described. So the problem is if you use caching enabled for state stores, so Kafka Streams has a caching layer, when the state store operations don't go directly to the state store, but are written to Alaru cache first. And then cache is flushed at interval either on size uh, trigger or uh -huh. during commit. And 
you have the same problem. You're iterating over messages. You're hitting the operation that does, for example, state store put, writing to the state store. Instead of processing the follow-on operations, they're just sitting in the cache until the flash happens. So now your context uh, flow is kind of broken because you're returning to the next message, you're closing this context um, of the message process and you're picking the next message and starting its own um, process yeah. uh, span. So what we're doing is we are storing that context along with a cached message so that on Flash, we can again re- rehydrate it, read it back and rehydrate it and continue on the chain. Um, and the second part of it is state stores, they don't store headers. They only store the message key and payload. And the tracing, okay. yeah, which is uh, sometimes causes that issue. Yeah, and the s- tracing context is stored typically as a Kafka header. So we need we needed to kind of devise um, a way to store the header data alongside the, the actual payload of the message. So I'm doing like a merged serialization. So I'm taking the bytes of the payload, taking a byte of the trace context, you know, merge them together, add magic bytes so I can detect that it was a traced message or not traced message when I write to the state store. Then on read, again, check for magic bytes and split them out and rehydrate. Oh, right. Okay. Hang on. Does that mean if I shut down the JVM and removed the agent and then started it back up, it wouldn't be able to read the state store? Yes, that's a problem. Right, that's you would a need to idea. rebuild the state store. Yes. Okay. And... The change log at the moment, the stuff that it reads to the change log has those magic bytes as well. So you would need to replace the messages from the original uh, topic, but have a ticket in the backlog to address it, to move the trace data from the payload into headers when I write to the change log. And then when rereading, rebuilding the state from the change log, then if it understands those headers, it can add the trace context as needed. If it's not, if the tracing library is removed, it will just ignore it because it doesn't care in the normal flow about those okay. headers. That, that, yeah, that makes sense. That'd be a lot faster. Mm. And so so you've done that for Kafka Streams. You've added a lot in for Kafka Streams. You've also said uh, you've been doing work with Connect as well. So. Yeah. The Connect has similar and different issues two kind of gaps. So there is no specific instrumentation for connect in open telemetry at all. There are only, you can use the same uh, tracing interceptors or uh, agent, but it just targets the consumer and producer within the connect uh, workers and connectors. Mm-hmm. So depending if you're using sync or source connector, your consumer would trace, record the, the span for receiving the message for the sync connector, but that's basically the last thing it will record. The next, what happens after in your connector would be either disconnected or lost. Uh, okay. Yeah. And the same for the source connector. The produced send will be recorded, but where it came from would be lost. So mainly I was looking at replicator, which is a combination of consumer and producer. Yep. But the, the, the propagation between the consumer and the producer was broken in it because it has similar uh, logic. When it consumes the messages, whatever the source is, whether it's the database or replicator, which is Kafka consumer or MQ, uh, first it writes it to intermediate buffer, then converts it to internal connect record objects, and then iterates on the buffer and produces them all. And that, as I was explaining, the tracing context is lost because you're using that intermediate buffer. So you're no yeah. longer using the tracing iterator. So again, similar, we're recording the context, we're storing it and rehydrating it um, when we're going into the produce. We added a few extra features like tracing for simple message transforms so that you have a chain of transformations. You could pinpoint if some of them are slow or breaking or, you know, to have that correlation. Or corrupting things, presumably. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then a second part of it that is not very well kind of addressed yet in OpenTelemetry, I find, is that 
it's more targeting individual services like microservices. Yeah, so right. you have a resource attribute there that says my service is, I don't know, let's say place order service yeah. or add to cart service or something. But Connect is a platform. So your single instance of Connect can run 20 different Connect workers and all of them are actually individual services that belong to different flows. So you yeah. don't want to name that instance saying connect platform one because <laughs> that's not very helpful. What is it like? Yeah. Yes, all the workers then record a single service. So what I had to add is some overrides so that I extract from connect connector name basically from the config from the instance of the connector running and then override that resource attribute based on that connector name. So that the traces recorded by all the different connector worker instances have the names that correspond to the connector, not to the instance that runs them, not overall platform instance. Right, yeah. And the things that would be applicable to a lot to say tracing Flink or tracing KSQL again, or kind of any platform that runs jobs when you want the, the name of the service to correspond to the job itself, not to the platform instance. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Have you not that makes me wonder, have you done any work with KSQL on this yet? Not yet. I haven't looked into it deeper. I know that it uses Kafka Streams as runtime, so my hope is that most of the Kafka Streams work would be applicable to fix, again, the same issues, propagation, state store operations, and things like that. But um, it will probably be a mix of kind of connect issues and Kafka Streams issues, because then again, it's like platform side of it and extracting individual workflows, individual jobs and their metadata and capturing it accurately yeah. as part of the trace. You must spend a lot of time diving into the Kafka Streams code base and just figuring out exactly how it works and writing new rules. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I, we actually, on a kind of separate topic, we did a, a hackathon with a colleague on uh, geospatial Kafka Streams usage. Oh, yeah. And part of it, uh, we were substituting RocksDB with Lucene and figuring out how that would work. So that was that the, the previous work with open telemetry and figuring out the whole flows of where the writes are, where the reads, how it all hangs together helps yeah, you yeah. that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I can see how you build on that. That's cool. So what's the what's the actual final experience at the moment with this? Is it you know, if as um as a user, as a debugger who's traced who's got nicely traced code, what am I actually gonna see? Is there an open telemetry GUI that now shows me my Kafka Streams topology or something? Uh, not topology as such, but the flow of the message. So you have your spans. So I have a demo application or test applications that I'm using that is like a transaction bank or something like that, uh, processing like okay. withdrawal or deposit. Really simple flow. So it has an account uh, K table that stores account details. Is a bank account open or closed? And then transaction, which is either deposit or withdrawal. So the typical transaction, say for withdrawal, that goes in the way it gets traced. You have your uh, producer send recorded. Then Kafka Streams application uh, process picking it up and processing it. Then look up so the the accounts K table fetch reading the mm -hmm. accounts details. Next, fetch of the state store for account balance, the aggregate value, the current aggregate value of it, then update of it as the next operation, and then send off of the output to the consumer, and then consumer picking it up. So it has that right. kind of flow of operations that touching either state store or external systems. Yep. So we are not tracing each node in the topology. If there is like a flat map or filter, that doesn't get traced at the moment as individual span. But anything that stores data or fetches data, uh, that gets traced, all the kind of storage points, I guess. You would see the data as it goes from topic to topic, maybe not internal topics. Uh, it would show internal topics in oh, partitions, okay. change logs, and, and reads, yes. And the good thing about it is uh, OpenTelemetry has a con concept of linked traces or linked spans. So when 
I'm recording, say, read from State Store, account State Store, it records a link to the previous update of it. So you can navigate from this trace straight to the trace that shows what was the flow that updated the value I just read. So if there is an issue with that data, you can go and look at the last update to it and its flow and find its logs and all oh, trace so, and all so that. So you could track back through someone's account history in your example? Yes, yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. That's groovy. So, and and this is all uh, some open telemetry front-end GUI or what's the actual tool? Um, so open telemetry doesn't have a GUI or backend as such. It okay. terminates as a collector and exporter at kind of data agent side. So you have agent running in your apps that send traces to the collector set. And the collectors, you can specify additional batching, pre-processing, filtering of it, and then exporting to whatever the storage and GUI is. So there uh -huh. is open source Jaeger, which is again Uber's um, open source product. But then you could be using Elasticsearch with Kibana or Splunk or Datadog, New Relic, Lightstep. Right. Lots and lots of you know, proprietary systems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so, what's the state of this at the moment? Is it open source, alpha, beta? If someone wants to get their hands it's, on it and try it, it's not open source yet. We don't have it running on the customer yet. So, we want to find a customer within Confluent, I guess, engagement that needs it and mm -hmm wants to kind of partner a bit to battle test it, basically. Because it's all written, it has integration tests and things like that, but it's never run on production platform at production or pre-production UAT, um, but like with a proper level of um, flow and use cases that maybe we haven't thought about and want to kind of iron out corner cases in something that is a bit more real rather than our demo application or integration right. test apps. You know? so, so really, we need to battle test this stage. Yes, yes. Cool. Okay. It sounds like if someone wanted to get started with this, then the first thing to do is grab open telemetry and maybe start writing their own interceptors if they're feeling spicy. Yes, it depends. Like, I find interceptors the, for the agent itself are best for tracing libraries because you don't want to fork Kafka streams. You don't want to fork mm. the library you're using. So the way to trace it is usually to write that aspect-oriented code that you can run at right places within the library. But then if you have your, your own application side, your business logic and so on, it's easier and probably better most of the time just to add add span and you know with span annotation or create span here, create span there. The, right. Those are attributes that are relevant to my domains that I want captured along with the span, you know, from my message uh, okay. and things like okay. that. Okay, I see. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the difference is do I control the source code? Happily. Do I control the or source codes and uh, how generic it is? If it's my app that is only doing my thing and it's my business logic, then there is no point to write interceptors for it because it's like singular, basically, or not very widely reusable. Yeah, you, there's no value to the overhead of mm. writing byte buddy code. Yeah. Now, if you're writing a library, like if you're a big corporation, Netflix, say, size, or Vix, Uber, whoever, mm -hmm. and you write your platform teams that writing a library to be used by your application teams, then you can either bake in the tracing code, because again, you could control the source code, or use the interceptors to kind of separate the code that does the legwork of messaging and tracing kind of separately from it, and okay. it's distributed separately, potentially. Cool. Cool. I, I think I've got that. Um, yeah. Oh, there, was, there was one other question I wanted to ask you, which kind of relates to all this. Um, it's the distinction between like synchronous processes and asynchronous processes. I, I got the sense from reading some of the open telemetry documentation that there was, that it was more, 
that it had come from a background of dealing with like traditional synchronous processing. And the yes, that's correct. nature of Kafka is, is not quite, it's something that's been less well thought through. Is that fair? That is correct. The semantic convention for messaging, for synchronous messaging, is still being developed. It's very recent. And the main use case was hundreds of microservices, but they all deal in request response pattern. So have a clear request response. Maybe not not necessarily blocking, not necessarily always synchronous, but always more or less um, going through the chain of calls. You still have that, here's a request. I need to build up the response in whatever ways, hitting whatever number of services. Right, yeah. With Kafka and with general messaging, it's a bit different. Sometimes you have that request response, but more often than not, than not it's here's a signal of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the event is a signal that then flows and it's aggregated, processed, routed, split and reached and can go in different ways into different systems. There is no direct correlation between the, the, the request and the response pattern there. Yeah, yeah. And on top of that, the kind of transport versus logical flow uh, considerations because the producer accumulates a batch of messages that it sends yeah. and sends them in a block. Now, do you want the trace that records that, that operation, the send of that batch, or you want the trace that traces the individual message inside the batch on its own? Oh, yeah. Or both, and then how do you link them together? And the same on the consumer side. You polled 20 messages. It took, I don't know, 30 milliseconds. But that 30 milliseconds is operation that polled those 20 messages. Do you want to apply that to each message and split it and record per message? Or you record both the poll and then processing of each message individually? Because depending what you're doing, if you're doing performance, analytics, then sometimes it's not fair to say it took 50 milliseconds to consume this message because alongside this message, you actually consumed 50 more messages in this case. Yeah, but it's also not true to say it took a fifth, like one millisecond because you can't straight divide by 50, right? Exactly. And the, the, the thing is, it's like what you're tracing, what you're trying to look at. Are you tracing a flow of the message through the system? Are you trying to find performance bottlenecks and you're more interested in kind of metrics. Um, But then should you be looking at the metrics and instead rather than the trace timings? Uh, Yeah. Or you're trying to find like a B test stuff. So say when it's taking this pass, it's taking that long. When it's taking this pass, it's taking that long. And then you are interested in performance, but you want it to be filterable. So you're looking only at some subset that's grouped in some way, say you are, you want to test performance improvement of potential config change. So you change it on some application, some instances, and then you're kind of comparing oh, yeah. one against the other. Right. So there, is, the there, tool- there is a lot in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like the tools are all there for doing it, but the asynchronous world brings up some new questions you have to answer. Yes, and the specification, the semantic convention is discussing that. There is a lot of uh, movement in that regard. Uh, I think it's getting ironed out so that you have best of both. So you record both per message flow, but then you're linking using the trace links, the transport level traces, and they're kind of separate but alongside each other so you can jump from one to the other. Okay. I, I could see people also using this to trace things like, uh, say, uh, ACA streams, like actor level models, which are very similar, right? Yeah, yeah. It supports ACA to extend. I haven't dug deep to say how, how much it supports it, but it supports a lot of those things. Um, the nice thing that I found is that it automatically correlates the logs for you as well. So the trace and spans that you generate, you can just enable uh, using MDC, like um, in context uh, logging 
to inject those into the logs that are generated while you are within that span when your code is generating them from the span. Oh, right. So then you can jump from the trace to logs. But I read an article on Medium recently from Vix. They wrote their own kind of Kafka library, Greyhound, I think. Mm-hmm. And what they do, they go in further. They inject trace IDs or message correlation IDs into the metrics that they generate. So then you can correlate the metrics back to individual message flows as well, not just the logs. I guess where it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Is that something? Sorry, is, is Greyhound a level above Open Telemetry, or is it completely separate? Uh, Greyhound is a Vix's Kafka client, kind of more rich Kafka client. So it's a okay. wrapper around Kafka consumer producer. And they added capability to write traces and metrics and so on into right. it. But it's yeah. just an interesting idea that read about there that sounds, yeah, why not just correlate logs? Let's correlate metrics on top of correlating logs and traces to stitch them into one kind of cross-correlated set of data. An idea you could potentially steal for open telemetry? I need to have a look, yes, I guess. But then again, it depends. Like, do you care which metrics you care being captured per message versus more um, aggregatable per instance, per thread or whatever. Because again, it's like courses for horses. It, it, what's the use case, what it fits, where, when you should do it and when you shouldn't. Um, yeah. Cause a lot of uh, performance analytics metrics are perfectly fine for performance analytics. You don't need the per trace granularity for it to see that your IO is slow. For example, you're hitting disk too much. It doesn't yep. matter for which message you're doing it. It's just for that instance, for that node, you're doing it. Now, things that I guess are more per message uh, performance analytic um, relevant is, is there something in those messages that is different from our other messages? Like, for example, checkout process that calculates some discount that uses some specific heuristic and this combination of parameters going into it is much slower than everything else. Now right. we're trying to then look, you know, is there a different process working? Is it taking time because there is a bug when it's like only for people from Canada ordering or, you know, <laughs> some combination or something? Yeah, those kind of weird combinations, they come up and you've got to try and have some way of finding that that's the problem, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. that's where it comes, that relatable metrics and perf data. It sounds very useful. It sounds like um, we have to wait for you to uh, publish more. That day will come. If someone wants to get in touch with you, especially if they want to battle test it, can we leave your um, contact details in the show notes? Sure. And there is uh, Confluent, I think, uh, open Slack, community Slack. Oh, yeah, Confluent community Slack. If you're on there, that's probably the best place to find you, right? I'm on there, yes. And I think there is a tracing channel or observability channel as well that's getting, you know, I'm checking it once in a while and other people would ping it to me if they notice. Perfect. If you're interested, head there. And um, we're going to get some more people from your department on because you're doing all the fun stuff, as I said. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Thank you, Roman. As we said, if you want to go and talk to Roman some more, maybe pick his brains, check out the Confluent Community Slack channel. Uh, Link in the show notes. Uh, It's easy to get in, and there are always plenty of us here from Confluent chatting with the rest of the community. In the meantime, if you've got a hankering for more monitoring-related information, you might want to go back and check out an old episode we recorded from Streaming Audio with Anton Rodriguez talking about eBPF which is interesting because it approaches exactly the same domain, monitoring, but from the level of hooking into the Linux kernel. I could definitely see a large enough organization wanting to use both. Monitoring's a large enough field to encompass both angles. So go and check it out, link in the show notes. Whilst that said, if you want to monitor more of what we've been doing here in the developer experience corner of Confluent, head to developer.confluent.io, where we have an ever-increasing library of courses, tutorials, blog posts, 
videos, long and short, teaching you everything we know about event systems, from design and implementation to monitoring and performance. It remains for me to thank Roman Kolesnev for joining us, and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you next time. Thank you.